And welcome to this edition of Hidden History, Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel, along with my co-host, Ray Smith. Good morning, Ray. How are you? I'm good, Keith. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Um, let's just get right into it today, Ray. Why don't you introduce our guest? I'll be happy to. We've got General Groves' grandson, Dick Groves, here with us today, and we're going to let him bring us up to speed on what he's been doing in the past years and months, but uh, also going to let him talk a little bit about it, any connection he has to Oak Ridge. I know he's visited, so uh, he, uh, we'll do that, Keith. So, Dick, right. if you want to go start, just uh, take it away. Take it away. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I guess I'll, I'll say, uh, it, you, you know, uh, because I, I visited you a couple of years ago. I actually mm -hmm. happened to go to Oak Ridge to meet uh, with Ray and hopefully others on it, our meeting was scheduled the day that Ed, West, Ed Westcott died. Mm -hmm. So uh, my trip to Oak Ridge was relatively brief that year. Um, but uh, I had been working for a couple of years on uh, framing a documentary series on the making of the atomic bomb not just on the Manhattan Project, but on the years ahead, uh, years before it. Um, so that's the work I'm doing. I'm, I'm currently in Europe. I've been here for a couple of years. And uh, I happen to, to be working on this uh, t a funny story. I went to London in February 2020 to meet with some producers about uh, uh, hiring some script writers to to start drafting the documentary series, which I've got is 12 episodes. And um, I returned to, to the Netherlands and uh, arrived back and was feeling kind of odd. I thought I had food poisoning. I ended up in the hospital and um, uh, they related and I was the first um, patient in the. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were losing your audio as well as your video there, but you're back yeah, now. Okay. Well, I, I think this is going to be a problem. It, it, the connections across the Atlantic don't seem to be uh, quite up to speed. But um, so just to finish this story, a few days later, I was back in the hospital and I was the first. Co hospital in Rotterdam. So at that point, I proceeded to um, start writing a documentary series myself. And um, 800, 900 days later, I'm uh, about to leave here in a, another month to return to the U.S. and start to try and move this forward. Good. I'll look forward. We'll all be looking forward to that in, uh, in the coming months, for sure. Well, it'll be in the coming years. Yeah, <laughs> it it takes it takes a long time to put together something of this scope. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Keith understands that from having made documentaries himself. So it does take a while, but I'm sure that uh, sure that you've got a lot of detail in there that may have not been exposed to the public before. Well, uh, Ray, I hate to say it, but uh, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I just said, I'm sure that you have more detail, especially if you're looking prior to the Manhattan Project, you'll have more detail than may have been shown in documentaries prior to what you're producing. Well, there actually hasn't been a lot of detail shown in most of the, I, I went through about 30 documentaries and films. And if you think of it, most of them are, most of them are under an hour's length. So you're trying to tell a story that's rather not just significant, but also extremely complicated. And uh, uh, to tell that in say 45 to 50 minutes is, is not, uh, not easy. So uh, I, I know I've talked to you before just on something specific, say on K25. Uh, the other thing that's remarkable about most of the documentaries to date is that almost none of them visually I see in the background, Ray, I think behind you on your 
toppled my right, the, the book with the red top and the, the black and white. Um, and I see countdown 1945, I see Smythe, uh, yeah. Isn't that the old? It yeah, is, the that's world. Okay, so if you, if you think of, if you think about the new world, so uh, uh, in that it'll have, I think, just on the subject of K twenty five, and on the on the concept of gaseous diffusion, on converters, stages, cells, barrier material, pumps, pipes, you'd probably find that it has. I'm going to say, oh, maybe five thousand words just on that subject. So the way to treat that is to treat it visually, because then you can actually put in a documentary series, you can show it rather than say it and get it across reasonably succinctly. Um, so you'll remember I called you at one point because I was actually looking for images of converters. Um, yeah. there, are, there are images, but as I think we know, they're from plant, post-war plants. And someone, I don't know whether it was you, Keith, or someone was kind enough to send me a table of all the converters, the, let's say, roughly 3,000 converters in K25 by size. Mm -hmm. the, um, I can't remember the, the specific nomenclature, but it, they went up to zero zeros, uh, or triple zeros, double zeros. And the thing that was interesting for me was to try and convey that the K25 scale, you know, one of the things that's completely lost in the documentaries to date is they'll, um, we know how big Manhattan was. And I'll ask some people that say they know the Manhattan Project, I'll say, well, how many people worked on the Manhattan Project? And they'll say, a typical answer is a, a couple of thousand, a couple of hundred, um, you know, because they're, of course, thinking about their vision of Los Alamos, which isn't even accurate, but they're thinking of Oppenheimer standing with the blackboard with some people arguing about implosion, as opposed to thinking about the construction of K25 and Y12 and X10 and Hanford and the 600,000 people ultimately that worked, most of them construction workers, who also worked on things like Hanford Camp and Oak Ridge and the SOM people that were working on Oak Ridge, you know, just this, this whole group of people across a number of, of uh, disciplines and industries. So with K25, what I wanted to convey to get across its scale, of course, they'll talk about how many acres it covered, that it's the biggest building in the world, its cost, et cetera. But just to be able to build it from the um, converter level, because now, um, that can be done. One, uh, I worked in real estate development. I worked with a lot of architects. It'd be very easy to construct a model of K25 and show that there were 3,000 converters and actually show what that meant, which the virtual museum, and I, ha I haven't looked at the virtual museum for a while, so I'll have to be, be careful about what I say here, but I think there's a tour in the virtual museum, the K25 virtual museum, and I think that used some computer graphics. Um, but, you know, thinking back, Ray, I think you were in a documentary um, around 2005 where you were touring Y12, looking at gauges and dials. And there were some computer graphics in that that were from 2005. And, you know, the computer graphics that were available in 2005 when they did uh, the, I think it was History Channel did some work on the, the time of, you know, uh, I found it away. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the plants for the atomic bomb, the computer graphics were just primitive compared to what they are now. You know, now you could construct, you could construct the entire story from the ground up. So I was trying to figure out just for accuracy's sake, whether the converters were as big as the ones that were shown in the video that you can find that actually has been used in a couple of documentary series. But those are actually the, I, I'm gonna say they're 
something like 12 feet in diameter and 17 feet in length. Those are from that plant in, I believe it's Kentucky, and that's post-war. I think the biggest in K25, just going from memory here from the table that you all sent, I think the biggest are about six feet in diameter. I think they weigh, the biggest weighs seven tons. But again, to just to finish this point, if you take 3,000 times tons and think of all the other material that was flowing into Oak Ridge, you know, all the tr train loads of cars for, um, I know in the Manhattan district history, I have a table out of that that had 20,000 cars, 20,000 train cars of material that went in. So there's, there's a visual story to be told, part by computers, but um, hopefully with um, images. I've been going through all the Department of Energy images, some great stuff, you know, Ed Westcott, the images from Hanford. There, there's a lot that can be put in to convey to a general audience why 600,000 people ended up working on the bomb. Uh, I think you're exactly right. Most people only have the concept of Los Alamos and most people don't imagine all of the other industries uh, around the nation that was engaged in producing parts for, uh, for primarily Oak Ridge, but also for Hanford and, and Los Alamos. But as we always say, 60 cents of every dollar spent on the Manhattan Project was spent in Oak Ridge. And uh, as a matter of fact, one interesting thing that that I've learned is the all of the insulators, the electric insulators for the calutrons at Y12, all of those were made in the Coors uh, Brewery in Colorado, mm. Bill Coors. Mm. Personally, made thousands of those ceramic insulators. He didn't have any, he didn't have a clue what he was making, but he knew. Uh, you know what it was for, but he knew how to how to make that ceramic insulator, and and he did those. And then you've got places like Dayton, Ohio, where the initiator uh, polonium was produced. And oh, a, a, an interesting note: Are you familiar at all with George Kobel, the spy, the Russian spy that was in Oak Ridge? No. Um, a lady by name of Ann Hagedorn has written this book, Sleeper Agent, mm -hmm. and it's a story of George Coble. He, uh, he was in Oak Ridge, then he went, to, uh, uh, went up to Dayton, Ohio, but he also fed information back to the Russians, I believe, about how complex Oak Ridge was and how difficult it was to get that uranium 235. And then along comes Klaus Fuchs out of Los Alamos providing information, actually provided the plans for Fat Man. And I believe that's why they went in the direction that they did. They had those plans from Fat Man and they knew how complex and complicated it was to produce enough uranium. Mm -hmm. So they went with the plutonium bomb yeah. as the first attempt. Anyway, that's that's just a, a sort of a side note of interest, but there were spies in Oak Ridge. I, I found evidence of three of them mm -hmm. that uh, that were there. But there's a lot to the story, and a lot of the suppliers of materials needed for the Manhattan Project were scattered all across the nation. Your grandfather would go to any one that he felt could provide what was needed. And, and his method of strong arming them was actually to convince them to be patriotic about what they were doing and how important it was. And, and I, I don't think it was easy to say no to him. His argument was a very sound one. The war was something that made everybody want to do something to, to help at that time. So I think he was able to bring a lot of major industries 
in, and to engage them in supplying the needed parts and materials for not just mm -hmm. Oak Ridge, but for the entire project. Yeah, yeah. Well, he had, he had uh, three favorites and uh, I, I was listening to uh, someone the other day was talking about how he wasn't a delegator. He didn't, uh, he was a great delegator, but he didn't really have to, he was, uh, I think, um, Stan Norris in his book talking about the mobilization construction of 1939 to 1942 uh, really gets at it when he talks about the work that uh, Groves under Somerville and the Corps of Engineers, the construction division, which was transferred from the Quartermaster Corps to the Corps of Engineers by Somerville, um, that he was working with Stone and Webster. Mm -hmm. He was working with Kellogg and he's working with DuPont. And so you have Hanford, you have uh, Stone and Webster for Y12, and you have uh, Kel Kellogg, Kellex for K25. Um, and then if you... Yeah, and you pair those with labs. You pair, you know, Y12 with the Rad Lab and um, and K25 with Columbia and uh, Hanford with the Met Lab. You you have delegated to some of the greatest teams in 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 this uh, uh, scientific and industrial development. So it um, uh, he he was a. Uh, as the head of the project, as the director of the project, he was blessed to have so much talent working in far off places. And as you said, yes, they had a they had their part to contribute to the war. Um, you know, they they weren't off to include the younger ones who were at places like Los Alamos. Um, they had uh, relatives and brothers and colleagues that were off fighting in the war and dying. So they had every reason to do their utmost. That, that's a concept that's a bit foreign to us today to even think about the kind of dedication that existed then, uh, an entire nation essentially uh, wanting, desperately wanting to do something to end the war. I mean, you, but you gotta remember over 60 million people were killed during that war. And so, it, and it is uh, the largest, most destructive war that we've had. And I think the people, the mentality at that point was something that we really just can't grasp today. Uh, yeah, I've actually added about an hour's worth of content to the series that I framed up because in asking uh, a range of people, not just uh, younger generations, but even asking people my age, how many people died in World War II, I get answers, uh, surprisingly, because most people seem to know that the Holocaust was 6 million, but I'll get answers of a million. Um, now, now from uh, some of the staff at the hotel where I'm, I'm staying, I'll get answers as low as 10,000 or 40,000. So I, I put in uh, large blocks, and also to establish the point that, um, well, uh, I'll just mention a couple of points that I've come to th think in working on this. Um, first, there a remarkable uh, coincidence that I try and develop is that absent Hitler, I have no doubt uh, the first um, application of nuclear uh, fission would have been nuclear power. It wouldn't have been a bomb. Um, uh, Frederick Joliot, Edgar Sangier, they had done a joint venture in May of 1939 between um, the French government effectively and Union Minier, which provided the, the uranium, um, to actually start working on nuclear power and to pat patent it. They did a series of patents in May of 1939. Um, but then along comes Hitler and Sangier ships the uranium to New York and uh, Joliot's colleagues go off and join the MOD, MOD committee. So it's uh, remarkable to think that this uh, dual use technology, fission applied for power, applied for a bomb, had it not been for Hitler, 
had it not been for Hitler's uh, anti-Semitic policies and for people like Zillard, um, Wigner, Fermi, uh, a, a dozen others leaving Europe um, and going to the US and for Zillard and Wigner in particular, working to kind of agitate in 1939 and eventually get Alexander Sachs and get to FDR. Um, you know, the US effort in 1939, which wasn't significant, wouldn't have gotten started. But at the same time, you had Frisch and Pyrrhals going to um, going to England, going to the University of Birmingham, and their paper in 1940 getting the Maud Committee started, and the Maud Committee then providing the Maud report that helps move Bush and Conant and FDR to approve work in October of 1941. So just a lot of factors, but they're all, they all start with Hitler. Um, and uh, absent that, I, you know, when we think of things like uh, these misunderstood modern episodes like Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, uh, we would have had nuclear power technology, this remarkable discovery of this energy source that's a million times more powerful than than, um, than uh, fossil fuels, I have no doubt would be a miracle of modern life. But again, because it starts with Hitler, it ends up as a bomb first. And then post-war, you have Russia starting on a bomb and then we end up in, a protract in the nuclear arms race and some focus on nuclear power, but not what it should have been and lots of questions about it and incumbent in industries and lots of resistance to it. And then in our times, say in the 1970s, lots of confusion with Three Mile Island, with uh, the China syndrome. I mean, we all remember the China syndrome, right? It's nuclear power, yeah. we're, all gonna, we're all gonna die because of nuclear power, because of the China syndrome. It's, it's, all, it's, very, it's very sad. You know, I work on it, it's very sad to, to realize just how how this discovery, this chance discovery in, on, let's say on December 24th, 1938 with Meitner and Frisch in the woods in, in Sweden, um, looking at Hans, Hans and Strassmann's results. It's very strange to think that that leads to all this effort that goes into a bomb and then more bombs and more bombs and more bombs to the point where we have um, you know, a, a, a non-proliferation problem now, I, I know at the same time, Richard Rhodes uh, says, I think persuasively, that the fact that uh, we have nuclear weapons has helped limit uh, the sorts of wars that we saw in the 20th century, you know, the big power wars. So I, I was a, an army officer for many years, so I appreciate that. But I, I don't mean to run on here. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, yeah. You're bringing out things that I, I am convinced many people don't realize nor understand how that uh, actually took place. And, and the idea that the, the redirection of this new discovery toward a bomb um, because of Hitler is a, a rationale that I'm not sure people understand regarding nuclear power. And it, and it did it did change the complexion of nuclear energy. Um, sure. and, and we're struggling with that, I believe. <clears throat> One point you were talking about the uranium that came from the uh, it came from, from Africa from the mm -hmm. and you said the man Edgar uh, Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it's astonishing to me that he's not a better known character. He's a uh, remarkable, remarkable character. I've spent time at the, um, at the National Archives in Brussels. Uh, and he was just an extraordinary character. He, in, in his uh, young career, he was stationed in Shanghai for a number of years um, and uh, in the 19, 19 aughts. And then, um, Union Minier sent him to the Congo where they had their copper mining operations to sort some things out. And that's where Shinkalobwe gets, uh, gets discovered during that time for the radium bi business. 
But in World War I, Sanger ends up in London representing Union Minier in the trading of copper. He controls copper and cobalt in a, a hugely impressive um, percentage of the world's supply of copper and cobalt, the copper being especially important in World War I. And then there he is in World War II um, with uranium. So just- uh, <laughs> The, the thing that struck me is that I have been butchering that man's name. <laughs> I, I have never known how to pronounce it until you have said it now. And I, I will try well, to it, change. Well, what... <laughs> well Ray, say, say your version of it. No, oh, say your version. No. Maybe, I'm a, I'm maybe a... I've got it wrong. Maybe you've got no, it No, you're right. Sanjay is probably correct. It's S-E-N-G-I-E-R. No, it's... And Usually. Correct. It's here. I'll I'll try and break it down for you. Sans G A. Sans G A. Okay. Sans G A. Sans G A. Okay. Sans -G -A. Thank yes. you. Edgar Sans G A. I, I but uh, you know, <laughs> that's it's amazing. Um, uh, yeah, compare the Manhattan Project. Just looking for an analogy that people might be able to grasp, and also to provide context for the speed. To me, that's the story of the Manhattan Project with speed. Um, yeah. But uh, I use the uh, analogy I compare it to the auto industry and I said, we all back in combustion engine. Daimler and Benz put a combustion engine on, a, on some wheels and then you've got a horseless carriage and you've got Drake in 1859 with, uh, with uh, drilling for oil in Pennsylvania. And then you've got the refinery industry. So that, that technological history covers about 60 years. And Manhattan, of course, is doing that in six, if you, if you count everything, but really three. Um, right. And by the time they get going, really like two and a half. So when you think of Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge is the refining industry that took the US 30, 40 years to create. And that included, uh, and I'm, I'm no, I'm no uh, authority on this, but there was the invention at one point of no-knock gasoline. You know, there were some big inventions in the refining business where they had to actually develop technology that uh, we all take for granted now. So. Mm -hmm. The remarkable thing about Sangier in the history is if you watch the documentaries, I'm trying to think now, because I've, I've kind of done an inventory of all the people mentioned in the doc documentaries. I don't think there, there's a single one that his name is mentioned in. And very few that actually talk about uranium as an issue. And that's all because he shipped the the supply to Staten Island. So there you have in um, August and September of 1942 that that one element. If you think of the auto story as one of extraction, refine, refining, and then um, uh, manufacture of cars, um, the extraction part of it is taken care of. Not covered in people. It was <laughs> you know, it grows on, I think, pretty sure on September 17th or September 18th of 1942, he sent Nichols, or actually, I may have this wrong. Uh, Nichols may have gone in August. No, no, Nichols went on, I think it was September 18th, 1942, to New York to buy Sanger's supply of, of uranium. And thankfully, uh, and he, Sanger was he, ready to, he was, he, you talk about patriotism, Sanger was willing to sell it. Yeah, he told him, he said, I knew you were going to need it. I've already shipped it over here, you know, and that's, that, that's yeah. tremendous. He, yeah. he saw Germany buying up his uranium ore and stop selling it to him and send it to the U.S. Yeah. Now, that's a decision by a single man 
that may have had tremendous influence on what Germany was able to do. Uh, that and of course, Werner Heisenberg, who uh, <clears throat> I'm convinced may have deliberately delayed the uranium program for Hitler. I, I have no way to prove that. Well, here, I'll, uh, I'll go out on a limb here and say, because uh, I'm thinking a lot about this in terms of what to include in the series. Um, uh, and I'll try and weave this in with something else that you were talking about, uh, Americans' knowledge of World War II. Um, I argue that, uh, well, let's see, I've, I've got a couple of points to make here. One is uh, absent Sangier, there wouldn't have been a bomb in 1945. I'm, right. I, and that's a hypothesis on my part that I, as I, ex so far I've been working by myself here, but as I, um, as I start to move this forward and get more people involved, I wanna have that tested. But, uh, uh, you know, I've been through the Manhattan District history looking at the input, the uranium inputs, and then the outputs from the different uh, fuel plants. And some of that's a little bit sketchy because the histories that were being compiled, the official histories being compiled, certainly like Smythe and the Manhattan District history documents, the 13,000 page book, uh, those were being done when a lot of stuff was still classified. I can't remember who gave me the table for the converters, but whoever that was, was, was that you, Keith, that no, provided? I don't okay. think well, so. Well, somebody I, sent that I, to I, me and they were, this was just a year or two ago and they were still saying, uh, it's a little bit sensitive because it may still be classified. And I'm sitting there thinking, why would, why would K-25 be classified? But that's, uh, you know, that's one of the, yeah, that's what they say about classification. Once it goes, it's like that uh, warehouse in the Spielberg films. You know, it goes back on the shelf, the yep. shelf that's 50 feet tall. But you know, um, that's one of the interesting things about Oak Ridge that I've discovered, and I'm sure Ray's discovered it too. We've talked about this, is, you know, there will be a, an image or something. If I'm looking for an image, a particular image to use in a, in a, in a, a documentary or a project that I'm working on, you know, and it is classified. However, you can find the very same in, image on the internet. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just interesting how things work. Yes, yes. Well, I think which, which, which reminds me, if I'm gonna put out a plea here, there, there are a couple of images that I'm interested in finding. I've been through everything that the DOE has and, and hats off to them just a great, great uh, source, the, the online material that they've got. Um, but uh, I'm very interested in finding two images in particular. Uh, one would be of converters inside K-25. Um, I've, uh, I've got some pictures of stages uncovered and covered with the, with the, um, the looking down the hallways, but they're not very descriptive. Um, but I'm particularly interested in any images of logistics at Oak Ridge, of the trains arriving, of the train depots, of warehouses, of anything that communicates the huge amount of material that was coming in for the construction of the, of the sites. <coughs> you know, they, again, they talk about 20,000 trains, <clears throat> 20,000 train cars, there ought to be some good images someplace of a train depot or something. There, there, was, there, <clears throat> there was no train depot. <clears throat> what you actually had was two places where trains stopped. One of them was at the Elza, <clears throat> and it was just a, a platform on a railroad track, but there were many warehouses right alongside the railroad track there. Some of those warehouses are still there being used for other things. There were even warehouses over in, in Gamble Valley, what's now where the Scarborough community is located. <clears throat> Many of those warehouses is where that material would have come in and been staged. The other location is it would come into K-25. <clears throat> Nothing there uh, in the way of a depot either, just a railroad track coming through and they would offload that material. And then 
uh, <clears throat> stored in whatever building that they that they wanted to use there. And the yeah. other the other thing about converters, <clears throat> and I'll I'll be very careful here, but I'll tell you, you will not find an image of the interior of a converter. Oh, well, no, Still, that, I, that doesn't surprise me. And, you know, I've got uh, two pictures of the Hudai Hershey uh, plant in Decatur. Um, yeah. But they're, <clears throat> they're not very descriptive. But, uh, yeah, I, don't, I didn't expect to find anything on barrier material. But uh, right. just to be able to, again, to be able I can't remember the peak number for K-25, but let's say 25,000 workers. Why would they have had 25,000 workers working on a building? Well, it's in part because they're putting in 3,000 converters, and I forget the numbers for the pumps and the you know, 130,000 control gauges and all, just all, all these different items. So if one can show some of that, uh, it makes it much easier to convey it visually, which is much better. So let, let me help you just a little bit with converter sizes. They're single lot, double lot, and triple lot in size. Yeah. A single lot is what was in the K-25 building. That's the smallest of the converters. And it was that's all that was in K-25. <clears throat> then they built K-27, yeah. K-29, K-31, and K-33. And those you had the larger uh, double alts <clears throat> and triple alts up in yeah. uh, Paducah and Portsmouth, Paducah. The, I believe were all triple alts. So yeah. the larger ones produce the, uh, the enrichment levels lower, uh, but the K-25 eventually was able to produce, actually by December of 1946, was able to produce weapons grade highly enriched uranium using gaseous diffusion. So that those processes were all those buildings were tied together eventually. So the material would start in K33 and wind up in K25. Yeah, you know, I've never, I've the, never I, I got this diagram that actually has notes for all of the, in, in uh, K25 for the entire U. Um, but are you saying it would kind of make sense that the biggest units would be at the front of the cascade yeah. rather than at the back. Right, um, and, and there were large units in building K-25. It was all small units. But you're saying that it, the, biggest, the biggest in K-25, because I'm not really, I don't really want to get into K-27 and what I'm doing, because that's kind of getting yeah, after that's the war. That's after the war, that's in the 50s. Yeah, so, uh, but, uh, but K25 is starting with a unit, in my, I'm not going to look for my table here, but it's something like, say, six feet in diameter, yes. seven, ton, seven tons or something. Yeah, so that's still, yeah. uh, that's still a really big piece of machinery to be uh, filled with barrier material. That's a huge yeah. logistics challenge to get off of a train car and get it into a plant without damage and get it up you know, in a certain floor in a certain position, just an enormous effort, considering the machinery that they had available then. That you're correct, <clears throat> but again, and, all, and also the clean the clean conditions. There are some great photos in the DOE collection of uh, you know you have to where it's clean beyond this point. But uh, I don't think that that was necessarily a concept somebody living in Happy Valley would have understood. <laughs> I agree. It's not now the the most familiar image that I know of of those converters is available online, and you've seen it, I'm sure. It's the one that that has actually has painted colored uh, yeah. lines running. They, yeah, that's uh, Paducah, right? Not be yeah. Sale, but yeah, no, it, I. It, there are film clips that are used in a couple of documentaries where people are wearing uh, metal hard hats. Yeah. And I'm sure that that's mm -hmm. post-war. That's- uh... Yeah, it was definitely post-war. You won't find any images that I'm aware of during the Manhattan Project. Now, Ed Westcott yeah. shot a lot of, lot of photos. Yeah. He got 
Y twelve calutrons. He's got graphite reactor. Mm -hmm. I have yet to find where he actually shot inside K twenty five. And that's what I was thinking. Now mm -hmm. his Hanford, his Hanford counterpart, Rob I think his name is Robley. Uh, yeah, they had nothing to do. They had nothing to do but take pictures of their one subject, their secret subject. They sure yeah. took a lot of shots. So I, I yeah. just, when it came to, I kept thinking when it came to trains and, and uh, things being loaded on trucks and such, I was thinking there, there ought to be uh, let me, some let me, give you, yeah, let me give you some additional insight. <clears throat> we probably have four or five, I don't know, maybe 600 images of Ed Westcott in, in Oak Ridge. Maybe more, but not a whole lot more. I think, However, Ray, I think we, I think, it's about a thousand. Okay. You mean, we'll stay with uh, that you mean a thousand pictures of him, of Ed himself? No. Oh, no. Uh, no. We have, we have uh, an archive, we have an archive of about a thousand black and white photos that Ed took. Uh, just, Ed, you know, Ed took, Ed took I, many more than that, didn't no, he? I, I understand that. Oh, I'm I trying see. to tell you guys, he put 15,250 negatives on cold storage in the archives near Washington, DC. That was a number that he carried in his billfold and on a little piece of paper. I made a picture of it when he told me how many. He said, let me show you how many images I made. It's 15,250. So yeah. there are a lot more images yeah. in the archives than we've ever seen. And I, I and I and I understand that, Ray. But what I would say, and I, you know, I don't dispute that. I'm just saying that when I started my first documentary, Secret City: The Oak Ridge Story, and I went to the uh, Oak Ridge Room in our library, I scanned a thousand photos that were a part of that uh, archive right. in, the, in the Oak Ridge Room. Right. So, Keith was. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking here. I'm looking at my uh, list of, uh, of all the documentaries I've reviewed. I'm just one. Uh, it shouldn't take me but a minute to find. I wonder if he's looked at yours, Keith. <laughs> well, I would certainly think I, I, if if it was on if it's on YouTube because uh, I I bought most of the things that I could buy from Amazon. But uh, it's so uh, it, just... is, it is online. It's. I'll uh, send you <laughs> yeah, we'll send you a link. Yes, no, I've got, is it Secret City, the Oak Ridge story? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes. Okay. Now, but that, you covered much more than the war, right? You go into the post-war. Uh, well, no, I did two different films. I did, um, the first film was just about the war years in Oak Ridge, and it was just the Oak Ridge story. Um, and then the second film I did begins at the end of the war and kind of goes up through about the early 2000s kind of talks okay. about yeah because because i have uh the what i looked at was 89 minutes mm -hmm. and, and of that i counted 12 minutes as having to do with the manhattan project and the i think the subtitle carried the dates 1945 to 2006 yeah that's the second one the first one was so called i haven't the, seen i haven't seen the first one then yeah um, the first one is the war years and it is online on pbs so we can send you a link I'd i'll appreciate send, that i'll send you the link right away when we finish here i'll send it to you okay uh ray i want to go back to something uh, we were talking about before so in terms of Americans' knowledge of, uh, of the war and such, and, and how many were killed in the war, um, something that's, uh, to, and to tie it into your point about Heisenberg. So another one of the, uh, I'll say, claims that I, that I um, have formulated um, for s subsequent review by others is that, um, only one country could have built the bomb, and that was the U.S. Because only the, only the U.S. was um, distant enough from strategic bombing. Uh, you know, Heisenberg. Even if the Germans had had the scientific talent, if they hadn't made the mistake about graphite, some of the other, if they'd had access to uranium, they still wouldn't have been able to build something if right. you look at uh, what they did with rockets and middlevirk and pinamunda and just it's 
it's so it's implausible that they would have been able to build a facility as big as K25 or Y12 or Hanford, put it underground, not have it attacked during the during the, the war. So and, um, and the, the, the fact is, that's why Great Britain came to the United States and said, look, we don't have the resources. We know you can make a bomb out of this uranium, but we don't have the resources to get that U-235. We'll send our scientists over to you. You put the resources together and make the bomb. Now, yeah. obviously, that wasn't the exact conversation, but that's exactly what happened. Now, that's literally how Klaus Fuchs got over here, was he came over with the British scientists. Yeah, yeah. But now, <laughs> well, the, so, the, but the point about, um, about U.S. knowledge of the horrors of the war, I think, is in part the fact that we think of the war as you said that it was the worst war. It was the worst war, but it was a lot worse than most Americans understand. I'm, my generation, you know, the, the, the boomer generation, the baby boomers, we grew up thinking that of it as uh, the great escape and the, the longest day and you know, just heroic war. But as we're seeing now in Ukraine, um, and it, there's a, a historian, Timothy Snyder, who's written a, a book called Bloodlands. You know, just the slaughter, the 27 million Soviets that were killed during the war. It's just unimaginable slaughter. But most Americans don't know that because, of course, the war never really touched our shores. Aside from Pearl Harbor, Pearl, and Hawaii wasn't a state, I think. Right. Am I correct? Was Hawaii a state in, in the war? I, I can't remember. I don't think it was. No. Uh I yeah. think it was. I don't know. No, I think it was 19. Was it 1950? Yeah, I think it was 1950. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so that as you may know, there the the count for civilians killed in World War II on U.S. soil by enemy attack was they say it was six. It was the this family that was on a this woman with five children who were on a picnic in Oregon came across a, a Japanese balloon bomb. Hmm. Wow. Ray? Hawaii became a state in 1959. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, well, listen, we've, we really look forward to what you're producing. I think we've, uh, Keith, I believe we've hit a gold mine here. I think what he's doing is going to be an exciting, and although it's <laughs> still years away, as you said, I think you're getting so close to it that uh, uh, maybe you ought to look at ways to disseminate parts of it. I don't know whether it's a book or whether it's uh, uh, what you might do. There are a lot of what things you can do online now that, as you mentioned, That's, with computer yeah. graphics, we couldn't do years ago that we can now. Uh, but I'm excited about your documentary and, and want to stay in touch with you. And I, I'm serious about wanting to bring you back. We would love to do this again. Well, and, and I'm, uh, I'm leaving here. I've been here for 800 or 900 days, and I'm finished drafting uh, eight of uh, the episodes and putting together a lot of the visual material. So, uh, Ray, you're, if you want, you can get me to Oak Ridge quite easily. All you have to do is come up with some photos of railroads and converters. <laughs> Okay, that's the challenge. I'll I will get Actually, you some more to do. No, I I will be coming back. I'm I I haven't uh, figured out my itinerary uh, from here. Ray, you may remember I was living in Hong Kong before all this, and I yeah. I know I'm not going back to Hong Kong because they they're still in quarantine. But uh, I'm going to be heading to the U.S. in about two months, and you'll see me sooner okay. than later. Well, let's let's stay in touch, and when you uh, when you get to the states, <clears throat> we'll make arrangements for you to come to Oak Ridge whenever you want to, and uh, and we'll take you out for some good food. And and oh, by the way, I, I'll send you a picture to that we have the K twenty five museum now, one of the best yeah. you'll ever find anywhere, it, and it's really well done. Now, were and they trying it, to were they trying to save? Was it one of the fifty four buildings that they were trying to preserve? They weren't trying to uh, preserve. Yeah, they, they tried to preserve the North Tower, but we weren't able to do that. The none of the buildings were 
preserved. It's what we are, we do have the footprint and it is designated as a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, just at the south end of the east wing is a, a, a fire hall. And at that, in the second floor of that building, there's now the K-25 History Museum, just an exceptionally well done museum. That's a reason enough for you to come to Oak Ridge. Oh, I'll, I'll, come in, I'll come anyway, but, and does X-10, uh, does that exist? Yeah. Yes, the graphite reactor is also a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Of course, it's located at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, which requires, which is restricted entry. But we've just started the bus tours back and the bus tours leave the American Museum of Science and Energy and actually go to the graphite reactor. So you can get to the reactor now through those bus tours. And uh, also at Y-12 building 9731, that has the world's only alpha calutron magnets okay. and also beta. That is now, soon now this, to be open. We're working on getting it to where we can have the public in there as well. The scene in the documentary that I referred to, let's say uh, circa 2005, when you're actually at the face of the, of the calutron operation, um, was that, uh, um, was that the same sort of, um, was that the hall where we would have seen the photographs that of the Calutron girls with the uh, physicists? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that and, still exists and, in building three, building 9204-3. There are okay. two racetracks in that building and uh, two control rooms. They exist. Uh, it is not accessible to the public at present, but it is also a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. And, and will be preserved. Now, the racetracks, are they alpha racetracks or beta racetracks? Betas, they're betas. The only alpha magnets in the world are the three, or actually three magnets in 9731 that had two calutrons between the magnets. I'll send okay. you a picture. All right. And those are the big Alice Chalmers units yes. that, okay. Yes. And fact, so- they contained silver until 1970, and they okay. were using that to separate all of the elements in the periodic table into stable isotopes. And then in 1970, they took them out, took the silver out, rewound them with uh, copper, and put them back in, operated until 1974, and then they've been standing there idle since. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, I, this is good conversation, but we need to wrap this up. We yes. will have you back again, Dick. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and uh, I look forward to talking in the future. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. We'll thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ray, uh, who do we have? Do we have anybody lined up next? I, I think we do. I think we've got a, a young lady that's traveling around the country. Uh, looking at all of the nuclear weapon sites. Uh, she's on a road trip and uh, uh, I've arranged to have her come on next time. And we'll, Natasha is her first name right. and I can't say her last name well, so I'll work on that before we have her. But all right. she's, uh, she'll be our next guest. All right. all right, well, thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Ray. And folks, thank you so much for watching. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new Hidden History, Stories from the Secret City.